Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today on Wednesday, December 13th. It's also a great pleasure to be joined in our studio today by, is it a colonel? Is it a general? Actually, I would just say I'm a regular, I'm dressed as a regular militia person, which in fact means what regular people wore in the 18th century. AKA Jonas Spivak, who is the chairman of the Bennington Regional 250th Anniversary Committee, and also a member of the state 250th Anniversary uh, Commission, and also in his spare time, communications director for the town of Bennington. And we're here, of course, to talk about the 250th anniversary uh, that's coming up. And without Sean Harrington, the curator of the Manchester Historical Society, we would be in deep trouble. But fortunately, well we said. have uh, the two of you here today to kind of uh, give us uh, the lowdown and get us up to speed on what's going to be happening come 2025. All of a sudden, it doesn't seem that far away anymore which will be the 250th anniversary of uh, the start of the Revolutionary War, and then there'll be, a what, a three-year period through 2027, through the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Bennington in Correct. 1777, uh, where there'll be a whole series of events that uh, will be commemorated. And Jonah, I guess we'll look to you to get us started here. Uh, what's gonna be going on with all of these events? And, and I guess there is also gonna be committees for each individual town. Tell us all about that. Oh boy, a lot to cover. And thank you for having uh, both Sean and I come today to speak to you and everyone out there. Uh, I think one of the most important things you said as part of the introduction is anniversaries. That's a plural. Uh, we're not really talking just about one anniversary year. What is that? If we did one anniversary year, what is that? That's 2026. That's the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and some of you out there may remember the bicentennial. That was, of course, the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. We're now at the 250th. But our story really begins before that. So we felt it was important that we kick off these anniversary years by starting in 2025. That's the 250th anniversary of the capture of Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point by Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, which is very much our story from our area on writ large on a national scale. So that should be our kickoff so we can really take advantage of that. And of course, we'll be there along with the rest of the country in 2026, celebrating the 250th of the uh, Declaration of, in uh, of Independence. And by the way, that's semi quincentennial rather than bicentennial, mm. uh, or semiquin for short, I've heard some people say that, or bicentenary, say that three times Ouch. fast. Uh, <laughs> personally, I'm just going with the 250th. I think that's what we're gonna be here most people saying. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Uh, but then use the excitement around the federal 250th to propel us to our own signature 250th anniversary year for Vermont, which is of course the founding of the Republic of Vermont and the battles of Hubbardton and Bennington. So it seemed appropriate that we're not just gonna celebrate the one year. To tell the story right, we really need to have these multiple anniversary years. Mm. Wow. Uh, you did mention about each town having its own committee, uh, possibly if you want to, but right from the start, uh, I met up with folks like Sean and we had the realization that just telling the story from one town's perspective doesn't tell the full story. So our hope was to work together collaboratively with all the towns in our region that would like to to come together as a regional collaborative planning group uh, for a couple of reasons. One is what I already said, we'll tell a better story, but also we won't be competing for resources, reenactors, uh, time, venues, et cetera. It made more sense for us to work together than to work apart. Yeah, and definitely being able to being able to incorporate what everybody wants to do in a larger vision. I mean, we're starting to plan now. I mean, Joan has been, we've been meeting in Bennington, we've been meeting online, we had a meeting up in Dorset, and bringing all the different towns together, and New York. Yes, New York, that's right, and, nearby and, New York, so New York. important for us. <laughs> Absolutely, to bring them by and, and, and throw the ideas on the table. How's the best way to engage the public? How's the best way to engage the school children? How's the best way to bring people into the area who want to know, what are we gonna do to entertain them? You know, why should they come? Why is this, why is this information important? And you know, because it's our heritage. Yeah. And you know, we celebrate it, you know, of course, everybody knows the 4th of July, but you know, why the 4th of July? Well, leading up to the 4th of July, I just it wasn't a one-time event that happened. You know, they signed the Declaration of Independence and off we went. And there was a lot of things that led up to that, and there was a lot, obviously, that happened after that. And, you know, Vermont kind of plays a, kind of a small, pivotal role. Not that it's overlooked, 
but it's something they kind of usually play second tier to, you know, say what happened down in the mid-Atlantic. You know, a lot of people in Yorktown, I mean, you know, a lot of people have a general idea of what happened in Yorktown. And we talk a little bit about Saratoga and the Battle of Bennington, but there was a lot that happened in between. And it's off, often those branches is where the richness of the story comes together and the story of the people. And that's really where my involvement comes in. And Jonah actually keeps us all in line because if you want to talk about efficiency, this guy right here runs a <laughs> very efficient movie. <laughs> Thank you. That's Keeps very us on task. You. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's been a real pleasure to be a part of this. So well, oh, oh, we'll just go. to cut in, yeah. one fun fact talking about stories being broader than you would expect. Uh, the Battle of Bennington, well, when Burgoyne sent Colonel Baum to invade Vermont, the original target wasn't Bennington, it was Manchester. Uh, fun fact for you out there, uh, it was because of a local guy from Arlington, Justice Sherwood, that they ended up changing their objective a little bit while en route and going to Bennington instead. But that was one of those tricks of history that comes out, as Sean said, by looking at this broader story and weaving together those different pieces. Yeah, and from the history standpoint, I mean, for us, you know, finding out like we know they came through. We know that we know that the troops came through on the evening of the Battle of Bennington. We know when they were going to Ticonderoga, they came through. We know that after Hubbardton, they came they came through and they encamped. Right. And just trying to you know piece all those together, you know, to think that we had you know you know the militia units and these colonial armies that they, they were all converging and passing through Manchester and staying Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So yeah, Manchester has a key piece in this story. Well, it struck me that uh, it's it's kind of interesting that uh, when we look at the Revolutionary War period uh, and Vermont's part in it, a lot of the action took place right here in Bedding County, right? That's I right. mean, there wasn't a whole lot going on in the Northeast Kingdom or farther up north at that point. Some, yes. Uh, I mean, I know that Benedict Arnold went through Burlington or Lake Champlain to get to that sort of ill-fated invasion of Canada in 1775, I think, or Whitehall, New York, birthplace of the U.S. Navy. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, but it's it's just interesting that so much of the activity that took place in the Revolutionary period was right here. And what a wonderful opportunity for our educators to use the lens of our local history to teach our children. And that is one of our big goals in this effort as well. Uh, that appreciation of place is something that history can really contribute to. And it's really important for our economic development. If we want our kids to stay here in the region or come back to this region, uh, those, that sense of place that they develop early on is really important for making that happen. So are you going to be going out to schools and giving talks and conducting Absolutely. tours or bringing them to various sites? Or Well, uh, we've already engaged uh, teachers throughout the region through our educational task force. Uh, we talked a little bit about there being this regional committee. We also have a number of task force that we've created to address specific areas. And one of those that we addressed right at the start is education. So we have a number of teachers working throughout the entire supervisory union and coordinating with Manchester uh, Elementary as well as Burn Burton to look at ways that they can bring history through the 250th lens into the classroom. And there's work being done right now on a K through 12 series of easy to deploy lesson plans that teachers can use to start telling the story. And this is great because every cohort of, of, of our students, as they go through the educational system, learning about our story, learning about the 250th, gets them engaged and they'll be with us when we get to 2027. Hmm. So, I wonder if, in addition to um, you know, kind of retelling the stories of some of the big events, the large events, the the events that make it into the history books, like Ticonderoga and the Battle of Bennington, and uh, you know, Remember Baker and Ethan Out. Well, Remember Baker. Love rem Remember Baker. <laughs> Great story. Um, Will there be also some emphasis on sort of uh, the more hidden aspects of the, of, the, of this? Uh, of this time period, you know, kind of what was just, what was that area like in 1775, 70, 1776, economically and kind of in other ways? I mean, uh, are we going to have a chance to kind of explore kind of what, what it was just like for everyday folks who were just having to be caught up in the middle of all this stuff that they weren't expecting to be caught up in the middle of? Yeah, I mean, I, just speaking strictly for Manchester and certainly Bennington, I mean, you're talking to population centers of 500 people. 
you know, Bennington, Shaftesbury, Arlington, up through Manchester. I mean, you know, 500, 500, I think, in Shaftesbury, less than that in Arlington, and then about 500 plus in Manchester. And it was very much just, it was very much frontier. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you know, there weren't paved roads, certainly, or even, you know, necessarily. No I Route mean, 7? <laughs> there's no Route 7 <laughs> and no Equinox to stay at or Taconic or any of the other fine establishments here. But we did have a lot of inns. I mean, in, when you think of settlements, I mean, the houses, I mean, they were all rudimentary, you know, especially in the Manchester area in 1774, 1775. I mean, they would have been, they would have been. Uh, if Bill Badger was here, who's an architect, he would say they weren't log cabins <laughs> <laughs> because they were about, but uh, but they were very you know they would be considered you know very primitive type huts you know huts or small you know basic structures certainly not sawed lumber mills because everything was you know it was axe and clearing lands at that point I mean literally buckskin and you know and muskets I mean it was just a much different you know landscape back then and even when the surveyors came here I mean you know that we were chartered in 1761 Manchester was and nobody really came here until 1764 and then they started surveying the lands and none of the original grant you know grant that none of them actually came here I mean they got the grants and they sold them and I know in Manchester's case you know the you know they started cutting up before it was even surveyed which is why there's still some big black holes in Manchester when you start digging back through the land records also it's like oh you know <laughs> so well what happened <laughs> you know because starting at the big maple tree and going six rods to the east to the rock you know it's like <laughs> <Okay>. what? what? <laughs> so yeah I know wow. that, was a, that was a little bit of a rabbit hole I just dove down there so it's wonderful and we are going to tackle that a little bit in some of these events especially in 2025 we're going to be having a series of three day a three day event uh, covering the really the attack on Fort Ticonderoga although of course the attack happens at Fort Ticonderoga but we'll be interpreting the path that the Green Mountain Boys and Ethan Allen took through the Shires uh, and a big focus on that will be what was life like during those days we'll have information tables we'll have reenactors and part of the reason why I'm in garb today uh, is to illustrate the fact that we're using reenactors to help interpret this story uh, and also to encourage folks out there if you're interested in doing this or perhaps you were a reenactor back during the bicentennial reach out to us we'd love to hear from you uh, having a, a large group of reenactors locally that we can tap for all these events uh, will be extremely useful yeah I mean the the reenactors I know a few of them and you know they they are as faithful to uh, you know what life was like as you could probably find yeah. and you know they do this as a passion yeah uh, you know it's not just something that, I mean they get together so when you see the and, and you know the regiments that they put together are just they're, they're second to none and I'm actually really looking forward to um, you know seeing that being recreated you know th up and down the North Shire and the South Shire I mean I know we have encampments where they're exactly going to be located and for how many days we're gonna work that out so that way nobody's competing against each other we want them everything to be complimentary so even so they'll be here you know, so people can actually just you know basically step up through Bennington County instead of having to make a decision oh do we go to Bennington do we go to Shaftesbury do we go to Bennington? how are we gonna do this you're gonna like, want to no. do it all yeah honestly. I mean and having a map to be able to do that yeah. and in Manchester is actually the final resting place. I mean, Delwood Cemetery, we actually have a couple of the Roberts brothers who were, you know, went to Ticonderoga with Ethan Allen, so they're permanent residents. <laughs> <laughs> so is there going to be like a march? Is that the idea uh, from Bennington there through Manchester? There will be different or? options that people can do. We'll be marking the route that we think the Green Mountain Boys took through the region. Uh, we'll be inviting people to walk it, to possibly run it or bike it. So we're, we're looking at a number of different ways that people can experience that uh, to complement, again, the information learning about what life was like. And of course, we'll also be doing um, musketry uh, and then perhaps even some cannons here and there uh, to add a little flavor as well. Oh, that sounds like fun. What about the indigenous people? Or is there going to be any, any reference made to that, the folks who were here before the European settlers arrived and the... Uh, what, 1730s, 1740s, I suppose? Well, yeah, as Sean mentioned, uh, settlers didn't arrive in Manchester until uh, 1764, and Five, in Bennington yeah. it was 1761. So, But we do need to recognize and remember that for many thousands of years prior to any uh, colonists uh, uh, coming to America, there were Native peoples living here. Um, most recently, prior to us coming, uh, was, was the Mohican, Mohicans. Um, and they are still out there. They are the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans based in Wisconsin. Uh, these are their ancestral lands. We did reach out to them right at the get-go. 
And while they have said that they prefer not to participate in these commemorations, um, they, it still allows us to look at their contribution as our allies in the Revolutionary War uh, and to think about the story being much broader than just ours. Uh, and I, I think it's worth mentioning that while I try to use the word commemoration as much as possible when we talk about these anniversaries more than a celebration, because you make a good point for many Native peoples, uh, the Revolutionary War, the Declaration of Independence, wasn't a celebration for them. For them, it meant the loss of their lands, uh, and that is something we do want to shine a light on, not just Native peoples, but also other un underrepresented stories. Uh, of course, there's been a bias, particularly in the 19th century, to really focus on that small group of white founding fathers, but our story is much broader than that and can, in fact, and more diverse and can unify us. So let's use these anniversaries as an opportunity to shine a spotlight on those underrepresented stories. Um, and I'll, I'll toss one out there, which is uh, at the Battle of Bennington, the one Green Mountain boy who lost his life was Sip Ives. And Sip Ives was a person of color. So I think for people to understand that uh, we had not just Native Americans, but black people and women. Women played such a huge role in this story as well that we really want to try to do as much as we can to talk about all of those aspects. Yeah, and the indigenous, and for Manchester, I mean, we know, so we know, that we know they were here. I mean, the, you know, the, you know, we found, you know, there's artifacts that have been found. You know, there's, you know, small stories, there's markings on maps, but, you know, having anything firsthand, I mean, is, is impossible. And then everything that we're able to tell is told from, when I say our, you know, kind of the European yeah. influence is, is what, you know, is our interpretation or, you know, all the historical documents that we have were all written from that point of view, you know, unfortunately, specific to this area. So it's always very difficult. So when people make inquiries to the Manchester Historical Society, what do you have on the indigenous population? Mm. And with a straight face, the only thing I can say is, I know they were here. You know, they didn't leave any written records behind. There, was, there were, no, I mean, no written records and, and everything is, you know, for instance, I mean, the Equinox Valley Nursery, which is just up the road from where we're sitting right now, you know, Roger would plow the fields for, you know, decades and he would always, you know, he'd find arrowheads. He would find, you know, so there's large collections of things like that. Lather Plain, which is just down here. I mean, you know, we have a collection from the Lather family of arrowheads that were found on the farm. So we know that they came through. We know that they were here. We know that this was, you know, were there any large settlements? I mean, I can say, not that I know of, but mm. you know, was there 500 years ago? Very well could have been. Mm. You know, we just don't know where, you know, where it is. There's no, you know, marble, <laughs> you know, no marble monuments. columns for us to look and say, aha, you know, that's not the way they, they yeah. lived. Mm -hmm. You know, they had very minimal impact on the environment by design. You know, therefore the evidence, you know, a couple hundred years later is, just doesn't exist. Yeah. So That's it's very it's very difficult yeah. you know, to, to yeah. say. So folks who uh, you know get fired up by this sort of stuff, uh, what uh, should they like reach out to uh, their local select boards or uh, town committees or how could they get involved? Actually, maybe this is a good time to mention about the resolutions. Is that something you'd be willing? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so there is actually, actually you'd probably be the better person because I got the resolution from you. <laughs> well, yeah, we were, Let's go to the well, Sean here. brought it up right before we started talking. So, I, uh, so for people that are interested in thinking about this, yes, talk to your local select board members uh, because they have received information from the state Vermont 250th Anniversary Commission, uh, inviting them to sign a resolution supporting the 250th anniversaries. Your select board has it already, or if they don't, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, and encourage them to sign it. Ultimately, we'd like all 252 towns in the state to sign this resolution supporting the 250th. It's a very easy thing to agree. It just basically says you're gonna support it and that you'll designate somebody in your community to interface with the Vermont 250th Anniversary Commission so they'll be able to be kept up to date with what's going on and what opportunities there are available for the communities. Uh, but regionally, if you're here in the Shires listening to this, Bennington250.org 
is the website that we've created and we're continuing to add to. And it's a place that you could go to to connect with us and to find more information about what's going on. Uh, we are updating it at least monthly. So it, uh, we do ask that you go check it out. And if you have checked it out recently, go check it out again in, in the future as well. We'll continue to keep that updated. There's also a Facebook page, Bennington 250 on Facebook. How many towns have signed? How many towns have signed on so far? Well, uh, Sunderland has. Sunderland <laughs> has signed up, and I, I understand you are the liaison for Sunderland. Congratulations that for that. Uh, I, uh, I hope Benning that's the operative word. <laughs> uh, Bennington signed theirs on November twenty-seventh, and Manchester did sign theirs as well. Wonderful, and yeah. I uh, think I am the liaison. For as, now, as you should be. <laughs> Who else would be? <laughs> uh, I believe uh, Arlington, it's on their schedule. And again, I would hope and encourage all the towns in our region to sign that resolution. Yeah. Have you heard about step. any of the other towns? And, uh, Not uh, offhand, yeah. uh, but I'll I'm be getting curious. an update from the commission, I'm sure, probably right after the holidays. Mm. Great. You know, Jonah, one of the things that fascinated me uh, when I went down to the Benicum Museum, what was it, last month, and you gave a yeah. presentation about, uh, about all of this at that point, you noted that the Battle of Bennington was uh, the only Revolutionary War battle that has been celebrated and observed every year since it was fought, I guess. And therefore, it's the oldest one, the, the Battle of Cowpens that you pointed out there. Uh, from, what, South Carolina, I think. Yeah, that, you stole that, my thunder there, because I used to have that was 1781, say, so yes. they came, uh, came late to the party, right? That's correct. Uh, but yeah, that shows how important this history is to our, our region and our community. The fact that every year since the year it happened, uh, they've been celebrating this. And of course, the battle didn't even happen in Vermont, although at the time, the borders were pretty undefined. And for two glorious years during the Greater Vermont period, in fact, it was part of Vermont. Uh, don't know if you knew about that, but Cambridge, uh, Granville, Hoosick Falls, all voted to secede from New York and join Vermont. So for two glorious years, Vermont extended all the way to the Hudson River. And of course, battle, the Bank to Battlefield was well within our borders at that time. Uh, sadly, in, as part of the negotiations to get uh, Vermont accepted as a U United States state. 14th. Uh, the 14th state. We did agree to give that land back, uh, but there you have it. Of course, that, that, that was an ongoing controversy between uh, Governor Benning Wentworth of New Hampshire and whoever the governor was in New York about yeah. where that boundary line was and, of course, all those land grants that uh, Benning Wentworth handed out. Uh, not always in, in, in strict accordance with perhaps the rules of the time, but uh, they were helpful, I guess, in, in sort of helping him discharge a bit of a, a financial uh, bit of imperilment he was in. I think uh, I've read some interesting story about how his, a lot of his fortune vanished when a ship sank off the coast of Maine sometime in the yes, yeah. 1770s, 1780s. And, and then, you know, so it was an easy way to kind of, uh, I guess it would be the 1740s or 1750s, uh, easy way to kind of maybe recoup that loss uh, by handing out these land grants. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that whole issue between about, uh, you know, whether Vermont was part of New York or New Hampshire or an independent state, well, that was really probably the biggest issue on most people's minds at the time in the 1770s, right? Uh, at least around here. It's like, uh, that was what, uh, remember Baker and uh, Ira Allen and Ethan Allen were kind of consumed with, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's safe to say that uh, New, New York had the better legal claim, but New Hampshire was quicker to act. And in, by in so doing, and actually getting settlers to go there, uh, that created a situation that for the King of England was a little uh, more complicated. Because while the legality may have been on the side of New York, the King was actually pretty sympathetic to those settlers who had poured their blood, sweat, and tears into improving the land. And he, had, he dictated that New York stop doing that until he had a chance to consider it in more detail. And Wentworth was very smart. He named all the towns after towns in England. <laughs> right. Funny about that. Yeah, there was a little bit of diplomacy going on with that. I think that's a good point. And it was certainly divisive because there were people, I mean, there were loyalists, you know, mm. Tories in the area who wanted to remain loyal to the king. And there were, you know, those who, you know, wanted to have their own republic and 
really, I mean, for quite a long time, it could have gone either way. Mm. I actually love that you brought that up because it, it's so true that so many, for a while, we were kind of unified in the New Hampshire grants that against the New Yorkers. Right. But when it came to a question against king and country right. with the Revolutionary War, that was a different story. And that's where you had guys like, we mentioned Justice Sherwood, he was the guy that told uh, Burgoyne to go to Bennington instead of Manchester. He was a Green Mountain boy. He was in the rescue party that saved Remember Baker. And then a few years later, after the Boston Tea Party, which is the 250th anniversary just this coming weekend, uh, after that, he became a loyalist. Right. So when it was just against New York, it was one thing, that's just a governor of another province, but when it was against king and country, that was a totally different, different thing. And like you said, there was a lot of loyalists here. Wasn't there that one individual that 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 has honors as being a loyalist and a rebel? Yeah, you yeah, that? yeah, William Marsh. Uh, you know, we have what's called the Marsh Tavern in, in Manchester as part of the Equinox. I mean, the Marsh Tavern, you know, the Council of Safety met there. I mean, you know, Marsh was a very, he was considered one of our town fathers. That's right. And he turned, you know, turned loyalist after the Battle of Saratoga, right around in that area. And he came back and settled. He wasn't allowed back within Manchester town limits. So he settled just across the line in East Dorset. And he's actually buried in the East Dorset Cemetery. And his stone, which is very, it was a very unique stone. He was, he was also, he was a mason and his stone is beautiful stone, but he has a SAR badge and a loyalist badge. So he was literally That's, playing, you know, he was playing mm. both sides because he didn't know which way it was gonna go. Yeah, That's a very confusing time for everyone, for sure. Well, uh, this sounds like this will be a fascinating <laughs> three-year stretch here uh, coming up uh, very quickly. So uh, they can go to the website. What was it again? Uh, Bennington250.org. Okay. And learn more or kind of get in touch with you and say, hey, this is right up my alley. I, I got to get involved. We're welcome, yeah, and welcoming people to, you know, to inquire if people want to join the committees, if they have ideas, certainly on the educational and the outreach side, if you have talents that you can, you know, that you could provide for, you know, what's, what's coming. We're figuring if we start early, hopefully people will know. Of course, <laughs> today, you know, so, you know, we'll arrive like, I didn't know this was going to be going on. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> but we're going to do our best to make sure the word gets out. Yeah, yeah. Great. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there for today, gentlemen, but uh, thanks again for making the, uh, the time for this and really fascinating conversation. Uh, you told I, me we were going to be here for three hours. Yeah, well, thank well, you we for could inviting have been. us. We, there's I, clearly not enough time to tell this story. I so. know. There's so much more <laughs> that uh, we could uh, get into, but we'll, maybe, maybe we'll save it for part two of this one. I'm sure we're going to have you guys back here between now and 2025 to yeah, fill, in the, fill in yeah, the gaps, absolutely. as it were. Yeah. All right. Well, there you have it. Uh, Go to Bennington, Bennington250.org and sign up. All right. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for sharing part of your day with us. We'll see you again the next time. Thank you very much.